looking at the globe, the environment, economic development, and the communities, how do we bring balance so that people live in harmony and want to collaborate and cooperate with each other? That's what we're going to be discussing right now and how this actually ties together the three pillars of economic development, environment, and community development. This is Dr. Karina Kodoristalina. She is a professor of conflict analysis, resolution, and psychology. She is also the co-director of the program for the prevention of mass violence at George Mason University. And Karina, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your work at George Mason University, but what is this program for the prevention of mass violence? I've not heard this particular term before, even though it does exist. So is this a, a new and emerging study and dynamic that's going on in university campuses these days? It is. It's um, uh, one of the major development in uh, pieces, uh, conflict and peace uh, uh, studies. And I'm representing the school, now it's called School for Conflict Analysis and, and Resolution. Mm -hmm. But starting July 1st, I'm happy to share, we will be called Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution. It's mm -hmm. a big honor for us to have name of President Carter. And uh, we really are devoted to prevention violence across the globe. And by violence, we do not mean only open violence. We also speak about cultural violence against different groups of populations and structural violence, which connected directly with economic development. A particular group of people are excluded from uh, opportunities, excluded from access to power and resources. And also, we were talking earlier about how this directly relates to environmental violence and also environmental peacekeeping. Uh, because that's really the core of many of these emerging countries is that they have large swaths of uh, open territory, uh, sometimes mass numbers of people there, sometimes very few. But at the same time, we have to bring about this balance between the ec economy and also environmental development. So how do we do this? And what is the uh, let's go back to who is Jimmy and Rosalind uh, Carter? Uh, probably two thirds of the American population were not even born when they, he was actually uh, in Washington, D.C. So who is he and why the School for Peace and Conflict Resolution? Uh, uh, Jimmy Carter was the president of the United States who uh, devoted uh, his life. I think the most, most important is for me is not only what the president is doing during this presidential time, mm -hmm. but also how they spend time after mm -hmm. their presidential uh, position. And uh, Jimmy Carter was extremely active. He had a uh, Carter Center, which was working across the globe for reduction of violence, building peace. So the legacy of him and his wife going in different countries, addressing issues of environmental conflicts, violence, it's uh, Honor become an honor for our school to be uh, named after him. Yeah, and the interesting thing about him, that he actually was raised as a farmer, lived out his life as a farmer. He was also mm -hmm. a nuclear engineer, became president of the United States, was very much involved in politics. But actually, he's much more famous uh, afterwards with the Carter Center than he even was as president. Yeah, I agree with you. That's why it all for me is more important what he done. <laughs> yeah, looking at these uh, neighborhood associations, why are these so important? And how does this fit into uh, prevention of violence? But actually more than that is educating people to want to have peace and prosperity within their own communities, uh, their own nations on planet Earth, and to just avoid violence whatsoever. Yeah, this is very important. And what you see here is the logo of Neighborhood Associates Corporation, which I collaborated together now for six years. Mm -hmm. They came to us, to George Mason University, to our school, and they told, we're looking for somebody who really understands how to deal with violence. 
we need really need to understand that violence not just going outside the United States, but many communities in the United States, even mm -hmm. here, Washington DC, in Baltimore, in Arlington, and in Virginia, are really uh, are impacted by poverty, unemployment, drugs, and others. So they told we want to look into community resilience. And now, looking at uh, the community resilience, why is that so important? And how do you actually do that? One, by removing violence as much as possible, but also give them the resources they need for resilience. Yeah, this is a very, very good question. Uh, the problem is that uh, there are a lot of misunderstanding of um, that resilience constitute particular features or particular psychological uh, characteristics. This is, yes, we call this resiliency, but resilience is a process. And it's not just bouncing back after particular stress or particular problem. It's actually very adaptive. It has this opportunity not only to become uh, more and more uh, adaptive toward mm -hmm. new stresses, but also opportunity to manage risks and opportunities. Mm -hmm. So this is what really makes resilience very important. And of course, there are a lot of criticisms. For example, neoliberal approach to resilience really move responsibility towards the community. Mm -hmm. And it's important for economic development because it says, yes, community have to be ready to address its own problems. But uh, if addressing this criticism, we can tell that in reality, it's yes, it is maybe a little bit, but it's also move production of knowledge mm -hmm. and production of power towards the community. So right. we give them agency, we give them voice, and it's mm -hmm. very important. Yeah, absolutely. Looking at this whole notion of resilience, what does this truly mean? We see the, the wind uh, turbine here, uh, the housing and all that. But what does this really mean as far as uh, getting down into the community itself and the interactions within the families and then among the various families within these different communities? Yes, what it's important to understand is that resilience is a collective phenomenon. You could not develop resilience of community without participation of many, many uh, members. Mm -hmm. and what my research actually was able me to show that in many previous studies the resilience of particular neighborhoods was considered as a some very homogeneous group mm -hmm. right so we go to neighborhoods there are community leaders and there are community but what i found that what really impacts resilience process is identity and power within community itself there are a lot of groups which have more power or more uh, legitimacy. There are groups which completely excluded. For example, we found in our research that young fathers and male in particular mm -hmm. are less included in community resilience. And majority of legitimacy go for people who live there for longest time. And in many cases, it's usually older women. Now, looking at the communities that you're working with, I believe in Washington, D.C. and other areas, when you go into these communities, who are you looking for to start working with, identify the opinion leaders and those that truly understand the community? How do you go through that process? Yeah, this is a very important question because building trust with the community is the key. You mm -hmm. could not... Um, go into community and tell, okay, I'm a researcher, I want to study you, right? It's it's not appropriate. We really have to see them as a partner in research. They you have to see that results will benefit them. And then spending time with us answering questions that actually benefit them and not mm -hmm. us will just write a paper or something. Right. So why um, I was really, really thankful that we were working with uh, Neighborhood Associates Corporation. And also university, George Mason University, provides very good support for research by so-called OSCAR program. It's a program which allow undergrad students to participate in research mm -hmm. together with faculty. So I had wonderful students working with me on it. And we started with a Neighborhood Associates Corporation. They have their uh, people working in these communities. 
and they start, slowly we start building this uh, partnership and trust. We didn't start come and tell, okay, we need people to ask questions. Mm -hmm. We started just walking around and checking what's going on, participating in meetings, a lot of observations. And then slowly by snowballing, what we call snowballing and sciences, then we ask people, okay, we interview you. Who do you think else we can interview? Mm -hmm. So we didn't go in usual approach for like only community leaders. We actually spoke with almost everyone. Yeah, and what you're doing is you're really uh, going in initially, establish trust, relationship, open communications, and then you're looking for different spheres of influence, uh, regardless of the level within a society, because you want to know what is going on across you know, the whole society, not just parts of it, correct? Yes, absolutely. We want to see how community functions, what are limitations to this community, who excluded, who included. So it's, it's very important to be able that not just interview leadership or those who leaders in, uh, recommend, but also be able to interview very unusual people who never had voice. And looking at this, let's go to this, the reduction of crimes, and we're just about running out of time. But why this type of effort? We're looking at these different communities, and I know where most of these are. Uh, how are you able to decrease the amount of violence in these areas and we need to be quick yeah so um what is important is that in this approach to community resilience we concentrate on community practices mm -hmm. not a particular discussion but what community actually what activities community develop sustain and change in this process so community practices of resilience is the key because they change structure of conflict for example poverty they create community gardens they create uh, opportunities for example another structure of conflict uh, co poverty connected with stress and depression mm -hmm. and we were very, very pleased to find a lot of community practices which increase self-esteem of community for example they even the poor people with level of poverty they collect uh, some um, Pens and another school uh, um, school uh, suppliers and they mm -hmm. send to Kenya. Right. So, uh, they name school by uh, their community organizer. So it's really increased self esteem. And at the same time, they work with police. It was very pleasant to see how they work with police. They invite police, sharing with them their community center, mm -hmm. children. Um, Marina, we have about 10 seconds left. What do you see for the growth and expansion of mm -hmm. this prevention of mass violence over the next five, 10 or 15 years? We have to be very quick. I believe the most important is understanding the agency of the people on the ground and give them voice and listen to them and help them to bring change which they believe should be bring into their community. Thank you, Karina, as we create the Emerald Planet. Okay, thank you.